I'm sharing with you a letter that I've written for my daughter, Wild. The genesis of this letter was after COP27 in Egypt. A group of us, I mean, some activist friends um, that I have the pleasure of knowing and seeing there, traveled out into the Sinai Desert for a night. We did a sort of prayer for the planet. In that, I tried to visualize what the world might look like in 2050 according to hopes and dreams rather than fears. And obviously fear can be a useful catalyst for action, but maybe it shouldn't be the only um, aspect of focus when we think about the future. Because arguably, as Picasso said, what you imagine is real and our imaginations have real power. And if we gave as much energy to imagining the future we want to see and uh, envisaging that, working towards that, building towards that, um, if we gave that more energy, maybe it's more likely to come true. So I've written that letter to my daughter with the spirit in mind. To be opened in 2050. Dear Wild Wilderness Aya, I'm writing you this letter in the year that I turn from 34 to 35 years of age, intended for you to open in 2050 when you will be my age, 34, 5, 35 years old. What does the world look like for you? Did all of our hopes, dreams, plants and plans seed it in my generation, in my moment, come to fruition in your time? Did our worst fears fall away into the shadows of nighttime hallucinations? Did humanity turn it all around and rediscover that humanity and humanism is nothing if not deeply, intricately and beautifully woven in with the non-human world, with speciesism. I hope that biodiversity in your time is flourishing, that women have continued their fight towards equality and the divine feminine has risen in all, and that the religion of infinite economic growth that prevailed in my time became more nuanced by 2050, GDP plus, well-being economics, and we began to measure and look to grow the metrics that really matter. I imagine that technology has been extraordinary and that we're making water from air, renewables are powering the world, that paints and clothes are being made from captured carbon, maybe we're even doing teleportation but that technology has been kind of slightly put in its place and the addictive qualities of it have come to be questioned. And we've instead shifted focus to the most supreme technology, nature. And there have been efforts made around the world to really worship and empower nature and biodiversity to thrive. Do you remember all the ridiculous things we used to do when you were a kid? When our society used to buy food coated in chemicals wrapped in plastic, plastic that's designed to last hundreds of years would be thrown away in 30 seconds regularly. When we used to throw clothes in the bin, when we used to get phones, these incredible devices that had thousands of people involved in their making and precious minerals and metals taken from around the world, that we were so clever that we could make these incredibly complex, valuable, precious things, and yet that we would only keep them for a year or two. It was a time of madness. I think we got out of that time of madness, the time of addiction, the era where we were addicted to phones, to gasoline, to being busy, to energy, to GDP growth, all these addictions that pervaded our society, I think we finally managed to unshackle ourselves from some of those addictive tendencies when more and more of us woke up to our own sovereignty and our ability to find happiness, meaning and joy in other ways through connection to each other, relationships, community, through nurturing our inner dreams, our hobbies, our passions, through our connection to the natural world, to other species, to nature itself. And I think the more that people investigated their own ability to generate 
joy and wonder inside of themselves, the easier it became for us to move beyond the addictive paradigm we were in. And of course, the seeds of those ideas had been there forever, for thousands of years in the human consciousness. But I think in my moment, they were starting to grow and it was becoming more noticeable that more people were questioning the system and, and questioning what we were driving towards. And it was a beautiful transition to witness and be a part of. A revolution in consciousness was already brewing when you were a baby. So many souls were questioning the system, the madness of the system and seeking new and beautiful solutions. And I was so lucky. I got to meet so many of them. Sometimes they were called youth activists, people now old enough to be grandparents. Indigenous folk were coming from around the world to share different perspectives on how to live, different worldviews. And just all around good people were looking to their hearts for guidance. Many different indigenous communities from around the world talk about the seven generation principles that we should consider seven generations behind us and seven generations ahead. Now I'm writing you this letter as the next generation after me, 2050, when you'll be my age. But if you are to consider seven generations ahead of you, I think that would take you roughly to 2300, 2300 years. Just imagine that. Just imagine it. What's that world like? Where are we trying to go if our destination is guided by a vision of 2300? Where do we want to go? I love you.